sure how that was uh, going to turn out but but I think the intro works uh, I think it works really well hey everybody welcome back to submarine history and today we're gonna have a briefing on the German type 9 u-boat I feel like I have a personal connection to the type 9 u-boat um, one of the reasons I started this channel was the book gray wolf gray sea by E.B. Gassaway uh, a true account of the actions of two u-boat skippers who commanded the U-124, a Type 9 U-boat, also referred to as the Edelweiss boat. That book, it really struck a note with me, uh, not just because of the action in the book, uh, but also because of the human interest stories that were told in it. Still, um, the Type 9 U-boat doesn't capture the imagination of people quite like the Type 7 does. But did you know, uh, when you look at the top 10 U-boats in terms of tonnage sunk in World War II, Eight of those ten boats are Type 9s. This class of boat was a real unsung workhorse for the Kriegsmarine, able to carry the fight across the Atlantic to the USA, deep into the South Atlantic, and even the Indian and Pacific Oceans. Read the description to this video uh, if you can. There are a lot. Uh, there is a lot of informative links, uh, and if you have questions, please feel free to post them below in the comments. At the end of the briefing, uh, there will be a table with technical data for all the boats within the series, uh, and we'll do a little tour of the U-190 from World of Warships. Finally, as always, feel free to stop the briefing at any time to study a slide. So let's go. Thank you uh, to the United States Naval Institute for doing the work that they do to preserve naval history uh, from around the world. Consider supporting USNI with a membership so they may continue their mission long into the future. I do have a Discord. Uh, you should be able to grab uh, a server invite from the link that's embedded in the uh, banner uh, for this channel. Our references for today's briefing. If you only ever have one book about U-boats, it's going to be Rosler's book, by the way. Okay, so uh, the Treaty of Versailles prevented Germany from engaging in anything related to submarines after World War I. But the German military industrial establishment was forward-looking and saw the value of maintaining a core capability related to submarine design and construction. This would be accomplished uh, through the establishment of an independent design firm in the Netherlands, uh, referred to commonly as IVS, in 1922. IVS completed designs for international customers during the 1920s, but found limited success in actually building submarines. Two early successes in the 1930s were projects for Finland. The Finnish projects were the CV-707 project, Visiko, a 250-ton coastal submarine uh, that's shown on the left and the basis for the German Type II U-boat, and the CV-702 project, uh, Vereheinen class, shown on the right, a 500-ton submarine that would be the basis for the German Type 7s. In 1924, the Spanish government had an ambitious plan to build 40 submarines. 28 of those planned subs were to be built by Vickers uh, from their design catalog, but the remaining 12 were to be contracted out to other parties. Specifically, Spain wanted a 1,000-ton boat with a high surface speed, 20-plus knots, and an extensive range. The German Navy was interested in collaborating with Spain on armaments. As such, uh, Capitan Lieutenant Willem Canaris made several trips to Spain as an intermediary between German firms and the Spanish government. IVS eventually offered an appropriate long-range design to the Spanish government, referred to as the uh, PU-53 project. 
This design proposed a 990 ton boat surfaced with a top speed of 20 knots. Unfortunately, political instability in the region and Spain in 1925 caused the government to shelve the entire proposed submarine program. Germany would reach out to Spain in 1926 with a proposal to build a test boat that would meet Spain's requirements for a long-range boat. And by February 1929, the keel for the E1 uh, began being laid down. This boat would be 745 tons surfaced with a top speed of 17 knots and a 7,000 nautical mile range. The boat was launched in October 1930, with fitting out continuing and trials between May and July 1931. Once again, uh, unfortunately for IBS and the German Navy, uh, with the fall of the Spanish monarchy in 1932, the new Spanish government declined to accept the boat. Eventually, the E-1 would be sold to Turkey in 1935, where it served until 1947. Now, uh, with the success of the National Socialists in the summer of 1932, the Reichsmarine, under the command of Erich Rader, developed the, the uh, excuse me, developed the reconstruction program of 1932, with the goal of building up a modern battle-worthy navy by 1938. Part of this reconstruction program included U-boats. The size and composition of the U-boat building program started out very ambitious. However, the signing of the Anglo-German Naval Agreement of 1935 limited the size of Germany's U-boat arm, so they initially settled on 10 Type 1A U-boats, based off the E-1, and 18 Type 2A U-boats, based off the CV-707 design. Uh, because it can get confusing, I'll add here that uh, once the decision was made to greenlight the Type 1A and 2A, the Kriegsmarine began considering the next type of U-boat to build. Um, it was desired to have something size-wise between the 1A and the 2A, a boat that was agile and could do a lot of different missions. Uh, this would result in the Type 7, which began to be commissioned in the summer of 1936. Okay, getting back to the Type 1A. The Anglo-German Naval Agreement, it had its pros and it had its cons. On the one hand, it enables Germany to come out of the shadows with regards to submarine construction, but the con is that Germany's submarine tonnage could not exceed 45% of the total possessed by uh, the members of the British Commonwealth of Natures, uh, excuse me, na nations, um, which at that time meant a 22,000 and 50 ton limit for Germany. So the Kriegsmarine had this idea of where they wanted to go with U-boats as it pertained to the 1932 reconstruction program, and then things changed with the Anglo-German Naval Agreement. On top of that, uh, leaders within the Kriegsmarine have a sense that there could be another war soon, and what would be the role of the U-boat in that war. They knew they would need boats that met the following requirements. One, have sufficient range for a lengthy stay in the Western Mediterranean. Two, have enough speed to minimize transit time to and from operational zones and to facilitate quick and speedy results when in action. Three, carry enough torpedoes or mines to maximize effort once in the action zone. And four, be able to disrupt communication and supply lines in the, in the Mediterranean, the Caribbean, the South Atlantic, and along the entire western coast of Africa. So looking at the needs and the limitations of the present situation, it was decided to stop Type 1A construction after two boats. Instead, the Type 1A design uh, would be altered to meet the perceived mission requirements for an ocean-going U-boat and thus we get the Type 9. Construction of the Type 9s began in 1937. Six versions of the Type 9 boat would be built for a total of 191 boats with the Type 9C-40, the largest produced version at 86 boats commissioned during the war. Many more Type 9s were under development when, in the summer of 1943, it was decided to abandon further development and construction of the Type 9 in favor of the Type 21 Electroboat. From the laying of the keel to commissioning, build time was typically 12 to 14 months for the Type 9A, B, and C. For the D series, build time was 15 to 16 months. As with the Type 7 U boats, 
The changing battlefield environment required the Kriegsmarine to continually innovate and upgrade the Type 9. This usually meant extending the range by lengthening the hull and making it wider to accommodate more fuel. Also, uh, the conning tower was modified several times to accommodate better AA weaponry. A well-trained crew of 48 could achieve a dive time of 35 seconds or less. That would be with the Type 9 A, B, or C. Patrols lasting uh, 60 days were the norm, and oftentimes Type 9 stayed out on patrol substantially longer with the help of uh, the milch cows. Type 9 Ds could be at sea for over six months at a time without a port visit. All Type 9s had four bow torpedo tubes and two stern tubes. A, B, and C versions carried 20 torpedoes, 12 torps internally, and 10 additional torps in pressure-tight external containers flush with the upper deck. D versions carried 24 torpedoes, and they also carried uh, some of those torpedoes externally in pressurized containers in flush with the upper deck. Uh, up to 44 TMA, or 66 TMB mines, could be carried. The standard deck gun uh, was the 105mm SKC-32 cannon. By the end of 1943, deck guns began to be removed from all U-boats because of the danger of surface combat. At the start of the war, Type 9s were fitted with 120mm and 137mm AA gun. This configuration um, and quantity of AA was continually changing in general um, as the war progressed. Now for the rest of the briefing, uh, we'll center our conversation around two boats the 9C-40, since it was the largest produced version within the class, and the 92, because while it is a sub-variant of the Type 9, it, it's really its own class. Uh, we'll talk about the other versions when we get to the comparison table. The Type 9C-40 displaced uh, 1,144 tons surfaced, 1,250 tons, excuse me, 1,257 tons submerged. Uh, with a length of 76.8 meters and a 6.9 meter beam. Twin nine-cylinder, four-stroke, supercharged diesel engines provided 4,400 horsepower to, pro to propel a surface boat uh, up to 13,850 nautical miles at 10 knots, 18.3 knots being the maximum speed, and 63 nautical miles at four knots submerged with 1,000 electric horsepower. While the Type 9 was the biggest boat to be built uh, since rearmament began in 1932 until the Type 10B, um, Dunitz had a vision for an even bigger boat, a real fleet boat that could keep up with modern German surface ships and even be able to escort and protect German merchant shipping far from home. German shipyards were already overloaded with existing work, so it was decided to stretch out the 9C to make the 9D series of U-boats. The design work for the D series was done in 1939 and 1940, with construction going from 1941 to 1944. 30 Type 90 boats would be built. Uh, the first two 90 boats uh, were fitted, and these were actually referred to as 9D1, uh, they were fitted with two sets of three parallel Daimler-Benz 20-cylinder, four-stroke, unsupercharged diesel engines. These diesel engines proved problematic, so those first two 90 boats in the series, uh, they would be retrofitted with two six-cylinder supercharged diesels, and the boats would be converted for use as long-range transports. The remaining 28 boats, these are the 92s, uh, they would have a pair of nine-cylinder supercharged diesels, and a pair of six-cylinder unsupercharged engines for more economical cruising. Dive time was on the order of 45 seconds for these bigger boats. As with the Type 7s, snorkels, radar detectors, transmitters, uh, passive and active sonar were all used in different combinations at various times uh, during the war. There were some interesting innovations with the 9D. A couple 9D2 boats operated with the uh, Fock Echgalus FA-330 Bach Stetze, English translation wagtail, uh, which was a type of rotary wing kite known as a rotor kite. In the description to the video, uh, there is a link to a KTB for the U-177, 
On a six-month South African patrol, the wagtail was used on an almost daily basis for spotting, with some success. At the time of snorkel installation uh, for the U-190 and a handful of other Type 9s, the forward outer deck was cut back, eliminating two of the external torpedo storage boxes. This modification reduced the amount of air that would be trapped by the outer deck and in turn improved the dive time. Some of the more famous Type 9 U-boats include the U-103, which is second on the all-time tonnage sunk list. Over 11 war patrols, 265,754 tons of Allied shipping was sunk, more, of half, more than half of which was sunk while under the command of Victor Schutz. Reinhard Hardigan is probably the most famous captain to skipper a Type 9 boat, the U-123. Hardigan made two drumbeat patrols in the U-123, sinking over 120,000 tons of Allied shipping. He made a total of five war patrols and eventually was transferred to shore and held a variety of staff and administrative positions, culminating in him being placed in command of a naval infantry battalion at the end of the war. He would survive the World War II, ended up being a commodities trader in oil, and lived to be 105, passing in 2018. Two Type 9 boats uh, remain today as museums. Uh, the U-505, a Type 9C located in Chicago, Illinois, USA, and the U-534, a Type 9C-40 located at the Western Approaches Museum in Liverpool, England. And uh, I think that's all I'm going to say about these two boats right now. I'll probably do a separate briefing just on those two boats because they both have a pretty interesting history. So let's. Uh, so I'm going to prepare. So I'm going to present the comparison table. Um, I'm really not going to talk about it. I'm just going to present them for you. You can stop the briefing and you can review the data on them. If you have questions about it, uh, simply put a question in the comments. I'll answer it. Um, so do that for a moment, and then at the very end of this briefing, there's going to be some footage from World of Warships. And here we are at the end of the brief. But before we go. Let's take a look at how the Type 9C-40 is modeled in World of Warships. Now, the U-190 was laid down on October 7, 1941, and commissioned on September 24, 1942, so just under a year to build, launch, test, and commission into service. Now, in World of Warships, the U-190 is modeled after its snorkel and forward hull conversion took place, which was in the spring of 1944. Hence, no duck gun, and you also see the cutaway forward hull, uh, external hull. Now, uh, looking at the U-190, we see these rails on the deck. So what is that? Because I get that question from people. Um, so with the external torpedo storage, they would have had a cart that they could have put the torpedoes on and moved them either forward or aft depending uh, where they needed them. Uh, and this little bump in front of the conning tower on the deck, that's another question people have. That is the non-magnetic housing for the boat's compass. Now, during its career, the U-190 completed six war patrols under two different captains, and it was credited with two sinkings for 7,605 tons. So it didn't have a prolific career. But something interesting about it is that um, on its last war patrol, it sank the uh, HMCS Esquimalt, which was a Canadian minesweeper. Um, the UN-90, it would survive the war, and it ultimately surrendered on May 14, 1945, in Newfoundland. Um, after the war... The boat was tested by the Canadians, then sunk during an exercise at the location where it sunk, the Esquimalt, on October 21st, 1947. So that's it. That concludes the briefing on the Type 9 U-boat. I hope you enjoyed it. Maybe I'll see you in game in World of Warships. I'm 01Haiku on the NA and the EU server. Uh, until then, everybody, peace out.